part of Christ's body. And each one has a spiritual function that they are to perform. And the church doesn't work the way God intends it to do unless each part of the body is functioning the way God has designed it to function. So here's what Paul's trying to get across in this text. As believers, we belong to each other. My favorite term, and you often hear me say this, my favorite term for the church is I, I like to call it a faith family. Because we are a family that is united by our faith in Jesus Christ. That's the common thing that brings us together, is our faith in Him. And we're to be a family. So we belong to each other. We, we are to minister to each other and serve one another. And here's what we need to understand. And this so smacks against our American idea of extreme individuality. As believers in Christ, we need each other. Now let that sink in for a minute. We, 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 a lot of us have kind of bought into this idea of extreme individuality. And like, all I need is me and my family and Jesus. I don't need anybody else. The only problem with that is that's not biblical. God has designed the church to work together. God has designed the church to be a community. And we need each other. And just in a practical sense, think about it this way. You know, when, when we hurt, how many of you have hurt before? I mean, you know, is a good thing to do when we hurt to run off and sit in a cave by ourselves? I mean, is that a healthy thing to do? No. When we hurt, isn't it wonderful when God brings someone into our lives at like just the right moment? And we're hurting and, and someone comes along with just the right words and they encourage us. We don't have that if we're not in community together, if we're not together in fellowship together. And so the church is important. We need each other. So here's what I want to get across today. Is that the church should be a culture where we freely give our gifts to the good of the body of Christ. Let me show you a couple things. The first thing is this. In verses 1 and 2, we won't really unpack these verses because they're so familiar to us. But think about this. We need to remember that we cannot be true givers unless and until we give ourselves to God. We talked about that just a little bit last week. Uh, these verses are so familiar to us, Romans 12, 1 and 2, that sometimes I think we really fail to understand how really powerful they are and, and what they ought to mean to us. The idea is that this, that God wants us to give ourselves as living sacrifices, daily laying aside our own desires in order to follow Him. Daily, daily laying aside what we want to follow Jesus, putting all our energy and all of our resources and all of our heart and all of our passion into trusting Him and to following Him. I mean, Luke says it this way, daily following, picking up our cross daily and following Him. Um, and these verses also remind me of what we read last week, and I'll, I'll show you this verse. Well, the verse that really struck me about last week's passage, talking about the churches of Macedonia, is that they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. And so remember, we can't be true givers until we give ourselves to God. Now, Ultimately, being a giver, whether it's financially or whether it's using our gifts in the church, ultimately being a giver really starts with having a proper priorities. That's really where it starts. A few weeks ago, maybe a month or two ago, on a Saturday, we were, we were I don't know what we were doing. I think we were cleaning the house and we were struggling to get the boys away from video games and things like that. I know you parents never struggle with those things in your home, but we do every once in a while. And we were having some struggles and we, we just sat down and we said, you know what? We need to lay out what the priorities are. And we sat down with our boys and we came up with what we call the Preston's Priority Plan. <laughs> Had to be all P's, right? And so we laid down here what the important things are in life. Number one is God. I said, is there anything more important than God? No, they, they understood that. So number two, I'm not quite there yet, but I'll, we'll get to this too. Number two would be family. The relationships we have with one another are important. Number three in our priority list was then, okay, it's your schoolwork. You go to school right now, it's important. Number three is your friends. And number five is entertainment. And so it's great. Now whenever we have the issue, we say, hey, let's look at the priority plan. Oh, yeah, that's right, entertainment is last. I keep forgetting, you know. I mean, but, but it's laid out. And, and I was thinking about that this week as I was thinking about giving ourselves to God. We give ourselves to so many things, don't we? I mean, we give ourselves to sports, we give ourselves to our jobs, we give ourselves to politics, we give ourselves to entertainment, 
We give ourselves to a lot of things. In other words, we, we put our energies and our interest into a lot of different things in life. And so I was thinking of a priority list, really, for life, for us as a follower of Jesus. And, and I think you'll agree with this. First of all, of course, we know it's God. I mean, the Bible says this. God said, look, I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, and you will have no other gods before me. And God needs to be number one. None of us would argue with that, but I think sometimes we don't live that. Sometimes we do put other things in, in, in importance in our lives besides God. But God is to be number one. Second, of course, is to be family. As you go through the Ten Commandments, it's interesting. The first four deal with our relationship with God. Okay? Don't have any other gods before me. Don't worship any false idols. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. We go through those things. Then the last six deal with our relationship with fellow people. And the very first one is honor your father and your mother. Notice all parents said that. That was interesting. You know, no kids said it. But, but honestly, the idea is this, is that family is important. Family is the unit that God has designed to train and equip our children to follow Christ, to see what authentic Christianity has lived out before them. I mean, it's, it's incredibly important. And so, family. The next thing I would put is ministry. Luke chapter 9, I want to read you these verses. Jesus says to them all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever will lose his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits his soul? Now, we may be tempted to put job and school before this. Notice that's the last one. We may be tempted to put those before ministry. But if that's the case, that proves one thing, that we don't understand what ministry is. You see, ministry is not just, I have a position in church, I'm an usher, or, or I do this, or I do this. And that's, 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 a, that's an element of ministry. Ministry is nothing more than serving Jesus with our lives and serving others. The truth is this, and I believe this to the core of my being, it is that life is ministry. Our whole life is to serve Jesus. And when you understand that, you understand why job and school come in last. The Bible says this, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. When we understand that life is ministry, you know what happens to our job and our school? We do ministry there. We care about people there. We bless people there. Our, and by the way, the greatest place in all of our lives where we are really on display as believers is at our job, isn't it? And so it ought to be a place of ministry where we care about people, where we, I, I love it when people say, well, you know, here, I work with this person. I brought them to church with me. That's awesome. I, I, I think about this. Joe got these, these new T-shirts for Frontline, and, and uh, T-shirts, you know, we did that when we were in youth group. You know, when you're, when you're a youth pastor, you do that every, every occasionally to kind of unite the group with the same T-shirts and things like that. And uh, some of the kids, he helped, had some of the kids kind of help try and, and design it. And some of the kids had this idea. We want them to kind of look like our school colors so that we can wear them in school and not like totally stick out, but at the same time let them see what we are so that when they ask about it, we have an opportunity to tell them about our faith and invite them to youth group. You know what that is? That students understanding that life is ministry. And school can be ministry too. And work can be ministry. So understand, here's a priority list. God's first, absolutely number one. Then family, then ministry, and then job and school. And that becomes ministry when we really understand it. And here's what happens. Please understand that if we get the order wrong, everything gets out of whack. And our life becomes unbalanced. And, and the Bible says in Proverbs 1, 7 that a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. And so you got to understand, God comes first. We give our lives to Him. Now, the second thing is this. The second principle we find in verse 3, and that is that it takes humility to give of ourselves. My desire today is to challenge us all to use the gifts that God has given us to do the work of the Lord. But in order for that to happen, we first have to deal with pride. And, and here's why. Because pride is the greatest enemy of giving ourselves. I mean, pride really is our greatest enemy. Because when we're gifted, we want to keep those gifts for ourselves. 
We want to use them for what we want to use them for. And although our culture teaches us, hey, look out for number one, the only thing being prideful and self-focused really does is causes us a whole lot of problems. Have you ever noticed that when you're focused on yourself, you always have a lot of relational issues? <laughs> have you ever noticed that? Isn't that interesting? Here's what God says about it. Proverbs 13, 10, I like how it comes across in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. It says, arrogance leads to nothing but strife. But wisdom is gained by those who take advice. And so when we're self-focused, all kinds of problems come our way. Now in verse 3, Paul is teaching us that we ought not to think of ourselves more highly than we should. And, and really, this is the idea he's trying to teach, is that life, our whole life consists of grace. We were saved by grace. The Bible says that we grow in grace. And any gifts we have come by the grace of God. And so we understand today that we are what we are by the grace of God. Let me show you this verse. Paul understood this. He wrote this. Being an apostle, he says this, By the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Now here's what true humility is. True humility is not convincing yourself that you're worthless. And walking around like, oh, I don't have anything good to offer. I'm just too humble. That, that's not humility. That, that's false. All right? But true humility is recognizing God's work in your life. Recognizing that it's a gift of grace. Having God's perspective on who you are. And acknowledging that it's His grace that gifts you. And His grace that helps you develop your abilities. And so if we're going to really be givers and give of ourselves... We've got to be humble. We've got to look to others first. Now, we move on down the text, verse 4 and 5. We find that true giving of ourselves brings unity to the church. Paul, again, he begins to compare relationships in the body to the physical body, all right, to our body, to, to illustrate the importance of giving ourselves and to serving in the church. No part of the human body can do everything. No matter how strong we may think we are, no matter how great we may think we are, no part of the body can do everything. And that's very true in the spiritual realm as well. It's true within the church. No one can do anything, everything. And by the way, no one should try to do everything. We need to understand, none of us possess all the spiritual gifts. Not one of us. Now, there's three observations I find here. The first thing is this. Everyone is gifted for life in the body. Notice I put there, no exceptions. That's important. Everyone is gifted for life in the body. God creates a unique place in the body for every single believer. God knows what he's doing. And every believer has, has a God-designed role. We may not all have the same gifts. We may not all have the same abilities. We may not all have the same opportunities even. But God has given to all of us gifts to serve the body. First Peter puts it this way in First Peter. Each one has received a gift, so use it to serve one another as good stewards of the grace of God. What I've found is that the more we grow in Christ, the more we become like Christ, the more obvious our gifts become. And the more our gifts that are weaker become stronger. I think about this. When I was in college, I, how many of you have ever taken a spiritual gifts inventory? Anybody done that before you take a spiritual gifts? They were popular, especially back in the 90s. It was a really a big craze. And they're a good thing to do. They, they can be good identifiers. Um, I took one in college. It was part of a, a, a class we were taking. And... and um, it was part of a class that was taking at the church that was kind of a, it wasn't a Sunday school class, but it was a training class, but it wasn't part of the college curriculum. So when I do things like this, I'm always tempted to kind of mess with it. You know what I mean? Kind of, I'm going to write all the wrong answers here just to mess with people, you know? And then I'm like, don't be an idiot, all right? So I wrote down the right things. And, and I got, my test came back this way. I was gifted as, the, uh, uh, with the gift of prophecy. That's simply preaching the word. Gifted in the gift of teaching. They were high, but one gift was extremely, I mean, almost non-existent. And anybody want to take a guess what that was? My wife knows. What was it? <laughs> Compassion and mercy. I mean, they were low. You know? I may have actually said to my wife once before, maybe before we were dating, when she was crying about something, what in the world are you crying for? Grow up! 
I'm amazed she married me, I mean, to be honest with you. But compa- it was low. I mean, I had no compassion for people. I thought I, I kind of had a black and white view of life, and there's right and there's wrong. You do right, no questions asked. And, and, and so, as you can tell, there was a tendency in my life towards legalism a little bit. Um, and, but what I found is this. As I've grown in Christ, as I've tried to be in God's Word, as I've tried to serve Him, walk with Him, you know what? Those gifts have developed much more than they used to. And it's a good thing because in the role that I play, who in the world wants a pastor that's just an arrogant, self-centered prophet? Don't you want somebody who cares about you? And so I'm thankful that God has developed those gifts. And I say that very sincerely. So as we walk with the Lord, our stronger gifts will be identified, but the ones that are weaker, you know what? They'll be able to grow, and God can work those things in you. But understand, everyone's gifted. We're all gifted. The second principle is this, and this is important too. God gives us gifts to bless others. You know, it's God is the one who gives us the gifts. In fact, the Bible says in James 1.17 that every gift comes straight from God. Every good gift, every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. All right? However, God does not just give us gifts to just use for ourselves to, to selfishly use them for profit or, or to sit on them and never use them. They're designed to benefit others in the body. We see this in the life of Abraham. Genesis 12, we find the Abrahamic covenant, and, and here's what God says. He says, I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And listen to why. So that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And to him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Abraham, God said, was blessed to be a blessing. And you know what? That's true of all of us too. God blesses us with gifts to be a blessing to others. Listen to 1 Corinthians 12, 7. It says, to each one is given the manifestation or the gifts of the Spirit for the common good. We're gifted to bless others. Now, I was thinking, I was, I was so, Gary, that song you sung today was so, such a blessing. That song uh, you sung about, In the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. I love that song. And I was just thinking about this. How many of you ever heard the name George Beverly Shea before? Okay, a lot of people have heard that name. Um, Almost everyone over 40 has heard that name. Everyone under 40 is like, who? (laughs) Um, But George Beverly Shea, he loved to sing. He grew up in the 1920s and 30s. He was professionally trained in New York City to sing. And he was given an audition at one of the radio stations in New York City. And he was given a very large contract. And, and I mean, they just thought, this guy's going to be the next, you know, big singer in our culture, in our world. And he asked them, can I sing gospel songs? I really want to sing songs that focus on Jesus. And they basically said, no, maybe every once in a while, but you're going to sing whatever's popular. And, and back in those days, I mean, when you signed a contract, you had to do what you were told. There was no way of getting out of it. And so... What did he, what was he going to do? Well, he, his mother was praying for him. And before he made the decision, one Saturday night she put a poem on the piano. The next morning he got up and he looked at the piano and he, he began writing a tune for it. And you may recognize the song. The song is, I'd rather have Jesus than anything. And he says these words, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name. So he turned down the contract, and a short time later, he got a job working at a Chicago radio station where he could sing the Christian songs he wanted to. And while he was there, in God's divine grace, he met a man that you may have heard of named Billy Graham. And for years and years and years, George Beverly Shea would sing, and Billy Graham would preach the gospel. And it started with understanding that God gifts us to bless others. It's not just for us. So my question for all of us is, are you blessing others with your gifts today? Are you seeking to be a blessing to others by the gifts that God has given you? And here's why God does this. Because thirdly, Christ is displayed on earth through the church. None of us are good enough representatives of Christ by ourselves that we can represent Him really, truly. God designed the church 
to be his representative on this earth. And what we could never do among ourselves, God can do through all of us living in interdependence on Christ and by giving our gifts mutually in the church. That's why John would say it this way, by this, all men will know you're my disciples. By the love you have one toward another. And so Christ is supposed to be displayed on earth through the church. So true giving of ourselves, it, it brings unity. When we're all serving in the gifts God's called us to, we're filling the places God's called us to, and unity can come. Now, let me share the last part of this passage, and that's verses 6 through 8. And the idea here is that proper giving of our gifts and how we ought to do it in the body of Christ. Now, let me ask you this question. How many of you can walk on your hands? Can any of you walk on your hands? You know, get upside down. None of you can? I'm going to do it right now. You're right? No, I'm not going to do it. Um, <laughs> yeah. How many of you think I can do it? There was a time I could. Greg, you think I can do it? Come on up here and hold my feet, maybe. Um, there was a time I could walk on my hands quite a bit. I could actually, I used to be able to do push-ups standing on my hands. I can't do it anymore because I can't handle the weight. You know, <laughs> yeah, I'm not strong enough. Um, but there was a time I could. But let me ask you this. If I were to walk on my hands all the time, and everywhere I went I was up on my hands, well, do you think that might have a negative effect on my body? Yeah, it probably would. I'd probably have some serious health issues, probably some serious back problems. Why? Because you know what? Hands weren't made to walk on. Feet were made to walk on. And, and when I use those things properly, then health can come. All right? But think about this. In the body of Christ, we are to discover our spiritual gifts. We're to develop them as we walk with Christ. And then we're to use them in the body. So not serving where we're gifted or trying to serve where we're not gifted eventually causes the body of Christ problems. And it causes the body of Christ to not be healthy. When we exert ourselves where we're not gifted, problems come. When we hold our gifts to ourselves, say, no, nah, I'm not going to do that, it causes problems within the body of Christ. So, thinking about spiritual gifts, let me give you two pieces of advice to help you. First one is this. We ought to look for opportunities to give our gifts. Verse 6 says it this way. Having gifts, let us use them. In other words, we should use the gifts for the glory of Christ and for the good of the body. Now, I know that it's sometimes difficult it's sometimes awkward to, to find a place of service. But you know what? There are opportunities. There are lots of opportunities to use our gifts in different ways. We're, we're making some even this month. Talk to you just a little bit about Trunk or Treat. But here's an opportunity for you to help and serve our church. Um, there's all kinds of needs. There's needs for people to bring in candy. There's needs for people to serve. We usually have some, some, some sloppy joes or something for people to eat. There's people that need to uh, be, just be greeters. People that are creative can decorate trunks and, and so that the kids can come around. And There's all kinds of ways to serve. And, and, but beyond that, you know what? There's always need for help in Awana. Joe, we were talking to, just talking to Joe this week. There's, there's opportunities if you wanted to serve in Frontline, Sunday School, Hospitality, Clean Up After Church. I mean, hey, it's getting to be that time of year. We're going to have a church cleanup day soon. We're going to be raking some leaves. I know everybody loves that, you know. But there's opportunities for us to use our gifts. They're all across the board. And what I've found is if we'll get involved in some of those short-term things, some of those maybe we'll call them easier things in that it's kind of a one-time deal, what happens is you get a taste of serving that it, it sparks within you a desire to serve. And it makes it easier for to volunteer to serve in more long-term projects. I was thinking, um, what we used to do Sunday school bus routes in Jacksonville. And we would go out and we'd pick up kids many times in very kind of rough areas of the city. And we'd bring them into church for Sunday school and then we'd take them home. And it, it was a great ministry that we did. And um, we, we, we had this one big day where we were going to run all the buses rather than on Sunday, on Saturday. And we were going to do it because I think the next day was Easter and we were having a big family celebration. So we did it on Saturday. We gave them all kinds of Easter. It was a real fun time, but we did it on Saturday. And the, the pastor made an appeal, hey, if you've never ridden on a bus, you've never done this kind of ministry, why don't you ride one time and see what happens? See if God will touch your heart. And so this couple got on our bus that had never ridden a bus before. They had never done anything like that. And it's a pretty specialized, unique ministry. And certainly not for everybody. Um, they got on that bus, and, they, and we were getting ready to graduate college. 
and we have 60, 70 kids show up on this bus every week for Sunday school. What are we going to do? What's going to happen when we leave? Who's going to take this over? And this family rode one time, and they said, we got to do it. Where do we sign up? And I, we were able to train that family to take over that ministry when we left. You know what? Sometimes just jumping in and getting involved in something, maybe if it's even just for one time, that'll spark your heart to realize, man, life is ministry, and I want to serve. So look for opportunities. Understand that we're all a part of the body, and we need each other, and we need help to make the body successful and to, to glorify God on this earth. For look for opportunities. And then the last thing is this. We have to give our gifts with spiritual attitudes and motivation. In the last several verses of this passage, in verse 7 and 8, we see Paul listing seven specific gifts that are really related to speaking and then to serving. And, and it's certainly not the only list of gifts in the New Testament. There's a list of gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4. And the truth is not every gift that God gives within the body is listed within the Scripture. There are probably hundreds of gifts because God is so wonderful and He gifts us so uniquely. But He lists these seven, and I just want to go through them real quickly. And the first is prophecy, and prophecy is not telling the future. Prophecy is proclaiming God's truth. Really, it's, it's preaching the Word. It's, it's bringing the Word. So that's what prophecy is. Then there's teaching. That's the, uh, the ability to explain and to apply the Word to our lives. I have gotten... Uh, the opportunity to sit into different Sunday school classes through the years and hear others teach, and it, it always amazes me just the gifting that people have to teach and to apply God's Word. And I often sit and I go, man, they are much better teachers than I am. And that's exciting because they're, they're using their gifts to teach others. Then there's the, the gift of encouraging, exhorting, the Scripture says. That's building up people with positive words. And, you know, I thought about going through each one of these and pointing out someone in our body that... that had these gifts, and there are multiple people. But when I thought about this gift, I just, I had, I thought about one person. I thought about Wayne Smith. Is Wayne Smith not an encourager? I mean, I just, when he goes to the, he's standing in the back, and he's got a word for you, and, and I'll, just, he'll always, you know, I love it when you, whatever it is. And he's always got a hug for everybody. He never has a hug for me, though. I mean, he's always got a hug for everybody else, but never a hug for, I don't understand that. But no, he's always got a hug for everyone. He's always got a positive word. I mean, the gift of encouragement. And by the way, let me just share this. Sometimes when we're giving our gifts, we get discouraged. And when the encourager gets discouraged, that's a tough one. And so when others are struggling, we need to all be encouragers in some respect. But there's a gift there, the gift of encouragement. And so I appreciate you, Wayne. The... Um, there's also the gift of serving. This is the idea of working behind the scenes without the need for recognition. I mean, all of us know people like that. People who would just rather be in the kitchen. Just rather be behind the scenes. Don't need the applause. Don't need anybody to know. I'm just going to do it. And we need people like that. Then there's the gift of giving. And that's the idea of having a willing desire to meet the needs of others out of what you have. And God blesses you and, and you give it. And that's a unique and special gift. There's the gift of leading. That's the ability to organize and administrate the work of the Lord. We see people with those giftings. And then there's the gift of mercy. And that's a sense of compassion that causes you to reach out to hurting people. Um, you know what? We all hurt. And it's a blessing when somebody with that gift of mercy comes and puts their arm around you and says, Hey, let me encourage you. Let me pray for you. Let me help you. We need all those things within the body and so much more. And so Paul not only lists these grace gifts, but he also tells us how we are to use them and, and the spirit in which we're to use them. And, and ultimately, this is the bottom line. We are to use our gifts for the glory of God and for the good of his body. The church can never really truly be the body of Christ it's meant to be if every member does not do his or her part in serving the Lord and each other. Again, we need each other. Every one of us is invaluable to this body and has gifts that God wants to use to bless others. So the question today is simply this. Are you giving your gifts to Christ and His body 
or are you keeping them to yourself? This is, this is Pastor Appreciation Month, and people have been so kind. I've gotten cards and little things and a lot of Reese's peanut butter cups. <laughs> the, uh, the, um, in fact, I went into Iwana Wednesday night, and, and I got called to the Iwana room, and, and all the kids had little Reese's, Pieces cups, Reese's peanut butter cups that they were throwing at me as I walked in. It was great, you know. Um, and, and it is a wonderful thing. But as a pastor, let me say this. While I appreciate, you know, the appreciation, you need to understand that I appreciate you. And if you're serving the Lord and using your gifts, I say to you sincerely, thank you. Thank you for using your gifts. Because I got news for you. The body of Christ doesn't run because one person knows how to do stuff. And if you think that, you really don't understand life in the body. So thank you. And if you're not using your gifts, my question to you is this. What in the world are you waiting for? You say, well, I'm not a member. You're a member of the body of Christ. And you can certainly use your gifts here, whether you're on the membership rolls or not. And so my prayer is that we would give our gifts to God, give ourselves to one another, and let God use us in a great way. Let's pray together. The church ought to be a culture of giving. It ought to be the most natural thing for us to give financially out of a heart of gratitude, for us to give to others when they have needs, but also to just give ourselves to serve in various positions and ministries, to serve one another, to serve those on our job, those that are in school. That ought to be what the culture of the church is. Not a culture that demands, I want this, but a culture that says, I will give my life for the glory of God and for the good of the body of Christ. Father, thank you so much today for your goodness. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for calling us together here to be a body. What a, you, what a privilege it is to, to worship together, to serve together, to do life together, to, to just have the joys and sorrows of life together. And God, each and every one here, you have gifted specially for this body. And so God, I pray that we would take those gifts that you've given to us, and we would use them so that you might be glorified and your body might be built up, and that, Lord, you might have the victory and the glory through this church. So thank you so much, God, for your blessings. Thank you for these precious people. Lord, work in our hearts and show us where, God, we need to give ourselves to you more. And we'll thank you and we'll praise you in Jesus' name.